All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to DPLA Fest 2013. This is your fest, and I'm privileged to uh, be festing with you. I'm Dan Cohen, Executive Director of the DPLA. We're going to have a fun day, collaborative day of working together, uh, coming up with new ideas. At the end of the day, we're actually going to report back from all the workshops about those ideas, and it will give us really a blueprint for what's to come in the next year and indeed in the coming years. Um, I'm going to give a sort of state of the union in just a second, but I wanted to introduce um, some really special people who are helping us today, who provided us with space and people and time um, and funding uh, to help bring this together. So uh, I want to introduce first uh, Uta Poiger, uh, who is the Dean of the College of Humanities and uh, Social Sciences and Humanities here at Northeastern University, uh, who will welcome you to Northeastern for today's events. Thank you very much, Dan. It's a pleasure to welcome you this morning um, here at Northeastern, to welcome you on behalf of my university, to welcome you on behalf of my college, the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, and also on behalf of our new lab for maps, text, and networks. Let me thank in particular Erica Koss and Megan Bresson, who have been in charge of doing everything um, from our end of things to make DPLA Fest happen um, for the Northeastern portion today. When Dan Cohen proposed the co-hosting of the first DPLA Fest earlier in the summer, it seemed right away like a good fit for our two institutions. A digital library developing a physical foothold in the city of Boston, just a few blocks away in the Boston Public Library, and a brick and mortar college and university committed to doing pioneering work in network science, in computational social science, and also in the digital humanities. And what is very clear, and we see this spirit very much here this morning in the video already, is that the DPLA is all about collaboration. Last night's program at the Boston Public Library was an inspirational mix of tracing the quick three years since the concept of the Digital Public Library was born at a Radcliffe conference of tracing history and looking toward a bright future. It was two years ago, exactly to the day, uh, on October 25th, um, for someone who hardly ever deletes an email, this was easy to figure out, <laughs> that Bob Darton came to us here at Northeastern during Open Access Week to speak about his work on founding the DPLA. And it is amazing to see how far the DPLA has come since then and how far it has come since opening in April. One word in particular stuck with me last night and that is a world word that we don't see here very much in higher education or in politics for that matter this, uh, in this day and age, and that is the word collective. The spirit of working together collectively is very much in evidence today in the open board meeting as well as in the numerous workshops that the DPLA Fest is offering. And I am certain that Dan Cohen brings many, many talents to the DPLA. I also love that you came in work clothes today <laughs> of a different kind than yesterday. And one of the many talents that I know you bring is being the pioneer behind that camp, the unconferences on technology and the humanities that stress collaboration and exploration and hands-on experience. So it is a pleasure and an honor for my college to be co-hosting DPLA Fest, and I wish you all productive workshops on access to and analysis of the full breadth of the human expression in the digital world, and also much success in expanding old networks and in building new ones. Welcome. Thanks so much, Uta. Um, uh, we are lucky to be joined also by Uta's colleague, Elizabeth maddock Dillon. There's some wonderful creative digital humanities and social science work going on here at Northeastern, and Elizabeth is going to tell us a little bit about um, her work as founding co-director of Northeastern University's Lab for Text Maps and Networks. Good morning and welcome to Northeastern University and our celebration of the Digital Public Library of America. Uh, as Dan said, I'm the co-director and co-founder of Northeastern University's recently created new lab for texts, maps, and networks. 
This is a center for the study of digital humanities and computational social science that's supported by the College of Social Sciences and Humanities and the College of Computer Science and Information at Northeastern. Let me begin by saying that we are thrilled to welcome DPLA to the neighborhood. The Digital Public Library of America is an audacious venture built on an audacious vision that seems to have been conjured into reality at warp speed. Undoubtedly, it may not have felt like warp speed to those who put in the thousands of hours of work to create the DPLA, but standing on the other side of the curtain, I'm happy to proclaim that the sudden appearance of the vast archive of the DPLA borders on magical. Here at Northeastern, we could not be more excited about hosting this celebration of the DPLA and helping to build the community and the ties that will enable the ongoing work of the DPLA and its users. I want to take just a minute to tell you about the new lab at Northeastern. Like the DPLA, we have just opened our doors and we're eager to build our community to advance research and work in the fields of digital humanities and computational social science. Our, our website, up and running as of last week, can be found at northeastern.edu slash new lab, and that's N-U lab, or you can just Google new lab. The lab is co-directed um, by myself and Professor David Lazar, who works in network science and CSS, and he has appointments in political science and computer science. We've been fortunate to bring together a crackerjack crew of talented faculty across the fields of history, English, political science, computer science, network analysis, visualization and design, communications, big data, and business. At the core of the new lab is a research agenda defined by the collaborative and interdisciplinary work of these scholars. In addition, we sponsor working groups, conferences, speakers, and a cohort of graduate fellows. We're also working in partnership with the Northeastern Library and the developing digital scholarship group there. So just very quickly, a few of our research projects, which you can learn more about on our website, include the Boston Data Swap, which is co-sponsored by the Boston Globe, the Tapas Project in aggregating TEI uh, materials, the Early Caribbean Digital Archive, the Boston Marathon Bombing Digital Archive, and the Viral Text Project. In addition, we now host the Digital Humanities Quarterly under the editorship of New Lab Professor Julia Flanders. And we have a great Twitter feed, largely tended by our graduate fellows, and especially Jim McGrath, who's undoubtedly tweeting as I speak, um, our uh, Twitter handle is NewLabTMN, as in text maps and networks. So I encourage you to follow for updates about what we're up to. Before I uh, leave the podium, I want to take this opportunity to make one brief point about the humanities. There's an ongoing joke in the world of DH about the never-ending difficulty of defining the term digital humanities. And now that I'm co-directing a center on digital humanities, I spend a lot of time answering that question. What are the digital humanities? So I've been refining my answer and my latest stab at it is as follows. DH involves using new technologies to think about very old and enduring questions. Questions such as, how do we read a text? Questions such as, what's the relationship between the past and the present? Questions such as, what's the border between the human and the not human? How and why does this border matter? How is this border mobilized in the world around us, and to what ends? There's a fallacy, I would assert, in the way in which our contemporary world thinks about the humanities. Typically, the humanities are seen as the location of knowledge preservation, and the sciences, in contrast, are seen as a realm of knowledge production. It's for this reason that the humanities can seem particularly expendable in moments of financial crisis, and even moments of growth and ambition. Knowledge production just seems a lot more exciting than preservation. But this notion, this idea of a dichotomy between preservation and knowledge production is wrong. And the DPLA is a vibrant testimony against this false dichotomy. Certainly the DPLA is preserving vast tracts of material, but your presence here today and the workshops we'll all be attending indicate that we have a lot to learn in understanding how to make use of these materials. The DPLA is not just preserving the past, but allowing us to think in new and productive ways about both the past and the future. Again, I couldn't be more excited about working with the DPA, DPLA in this endeavor. So speaking for the new lab, as one new kid on the block to another, welcome to the neighborhood, welcome to all of you here today, and let's make some knowledge together. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, in the true spirit of collaboration, the DPLA Fest is, um, in fact, being collaboratively hosted by Northeastern today and Simmons, uh, the Simmons College uh, Graduate School of Library and Information Sciences, uh, Science. And we are lucky to have Dean Eileen Abels here today to talk about what's going on over at Simmons. And later on, I'll talk to logistics on getting over to Simmons so that we have ample uh, attendance over there as well. Thank you. So, the Simmons Graduate School of Library and Information Science is also thrilled to be involved with DPLA and to be a co-sponsor of the first annual DPLA Fest. The DPLA has proven to be an invaluable resource for, resource for library and information science educators in their teaching, research, and service. We have engaged students in experiential learning opportunities in the creation of metadata, data mining, and the development of apps. We initiate discussions related to information policies, open access, and copyright. Over time, I predict that we will create new courses and new learning opportunities on the basis of our work with DPLA. Today's DPLA Fest presents you with hands-on learning workshops as well as thought-provoking discussions. The DPLA also provides us with a platform for multidisciplinary and collaborative research, as you've already heard from our co-host here at Northeastern. And uh, we do research in areas related broadly to digital libraries from a broad perspective. This research will inform our teaching and will also enrich the DPLA, a resource that provides a very valuable service to the general public. So what does DPLA mean for libraries, archives, and museums? DPLA presents these institutions with both opportunities and challenges. First, we have the opportunity to share our local collections with others who would not be able to take advantage of these collections before, as you saw in the video just a few minutes ago. Equally, our constituencies will have access to many more collections than any single institution could offer. However, with this new expanded access comes challenges. The trend report prepared by IFLA, which is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, captures this challenge in trend number one, quote, new technologies will both expand and limit who has access to information. With increased access to digital collections, the need for information and technology literacy increases. The Institute of Museum and Library Services refers to these skills as 21st century skills and emphasizes the roles of libraries and museums in helping members of the general public to develop these skills. Then Library Journal's placement and salary statistics for 2013 notes that the true achievement of 2012 was the appearance of new jobs for librarians with responsibilities that include emerging technologies. The primary roles of these librarians, among others, are to teach digital literacy skills. But in the future, this role will not be restricted to one position title, like digital library uh, specialist or digital technology specialist, but rather become the responsibility of all information professionals so that our constituents, all of them, can have access and benefit from these incredible resources like the DPLA. So through this effort, we, the librarians, archivists, and museum curators can help to create an equal access opportunity. So the opportunities to engage with DPLA are limited only by our imagination. The DPLA encourages us to be innovative, technologically savvy, and entrepreneurial. What better message can we send to our students as we prepare librarians, archivists, and information professionals for the future? So on behalf of Simmons Gisless, we hope that you will enjoy your visit to our small and beautiful campus, and we wish you an exciting learning experience today that generates ideas to move the DPLA forward in new and exciting ways. Thank you and welcome.
Um, I'm sure you have many burning questions, probably foremost among them, how do you get one of these incredible t-shirts? Um, you're going to have to wait to find out how you get one of these incredible t-shirts, um, although they are out in the lobby and you probably sell them on your way in. But I'm going to provide an even better way for you to get a t-shirt, one that helps you contribute to our efforts here. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, I just want to provide a few minutes of overview of where we are. Um, some of you were there last night, but I think uh, others may have missed some big announcements, some new things that are happening. So I'm going to provide an overview of where we are, and then at the end provide a little bit of a taste of where we might be going. But of course, this is, as I said at the start, your fest. It's your place to come and provide ideas, provide energy, and we want to try to provide you uh, with opportunities to really contribute in many different kinds of ways to our effort right now and in the coming years. So let's talk about where we are right now. Um, the collection itself. We launched in six months ago in April 2013 with 2.4 million items. Incredible start, already very large. Um, but we have been growing since then and we announced last night that we've actually crossed, as of Tuesday at noon, uh, 5 million items, which is really fantastic. Woo! We're not done yet, um, but this is an incredible, uh, huge collection already, as Elizabeth noted, to be able to aggregate this wide range of material from all across the country is really special. That is, of course, done through our partnerships. Um, we have now over 1,100 institutions who are donating materials to the DPLA, an incredible um, set of partners. And those are funneled through our hubs, um, almost 20 of them, content and service hubs. Content hubs, of course, being large institutions that we have a peer-to-peer -peer relationship with and donate hundreds of thousands of items, and service hubs that act in their state and regions to help aggregate from smaller institutions that might not have the technical capabilities uh, to provide us with direct uh, links to their content. So these hubs are really, really critical to, uh, to what we do. And we announced last night that we're adding three new hubs in three great states, uh, New York, North Carolina, and Texas. So this will bring in all kinds of new material in places that we did not have hubs before, um, bringing our hub total almost to 10. Uh, we're at nine right now. Um, obviously, if you've, if you've uh, gone through elementary school, you know that there are 50 states. And so we have quite a, quite a ways to go. And one of the things that we'll be talking about today in the workshops um, Emily uh, Gore, our Director of Content, and Amy Rudersdorf, our Assistant Director of Content, will be uh, working to talk to folks who want to join us as a hub, as a service hub, so that we can get better coverage because uh, we've made tremendous progress, but we still feel that there are gaps across the country, uh, geographical gaps, chronological gaps, gaps in terms of the types of materials we have. We want to do better. We can do better, and so hubs are really critical to DPLA's network model but we are excited about these additions. Um, this is a, a big chart, which has small font on it, um, but is a, a, a visual way for you, if you haven't had enough coffee, you can just sort of squint at it and realize that um, we have lots of different kinds of institutions. We're really proud of the diversity of the kinds of institutions that are contributing. Of course, we have libraries of all sorts, college and university libraries, even community colleges, um, historical societies, museums, public libraries, archives, it's an amazing pie chart of diversity. Um, again, here though, we want to get um, as much as we can from as many different kinds of institutions. And I think there'll be a lot of ideas today from, from all of you about how we can do better to diversify our holding in terms of the kinds of institutions that we interact with. So we would love to hear more uh, from you about how we can do that better. One of the great things is that the DPLA sends its traffic to our partners. We are not imperial. We do not hoard traffic on our website. We pass it back out through our API, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but even if you come to our site, you are sent back out from our site to our partners so that they can actually register, that they're getting their material used more. And I think this is one of the big selling points if you want to become a partner with us is we are going to help you fulfill your mission to provide access to the content you have in your collections. That's really, really critical. This great quote from Minnesota Reflections, Minnesota Digital Library, which is our hub in Minnesota, uh, their traffic is up 55% in visits and 62% in unique visitors over the last year. That's really astonishing. It's really great. We hear this across the board. The Smithsonian, when they uh, donated hundreds of thousands of items, 
they had tens of thousands of new viewers of those items that wouldn't have found them otherwise. They're finding their way to the Smithsonian through our map interface, through all these new interfaces that we're providing, and indeed through new apps. We also want to continue to innovate with getting new items and new interfaces for those. And last night, we revealed this wonderful DPLA bookshelf, thanks to David Weinberger and his team at, the, um, at Harvard, who uh, had this incredible open source project called Stack Life, which was one of the great um, beta sprint projects that was highlighted uh, during the planning phase of the DPLA, where uh, people use the API and try to think about new ways into collections. I think there's some great innovation that's going on on our site and by partners and um, developers to use our API to make new ways into these collections. I think it's a tremendous advantage. We can really augment use, augment serendipity, and um, this great interface, which provides a bookshelf turned on its side, um, provides visual cues that I think people are used to from the bookshelf about the size of books, um, the number of pages in them, uh, dates, and so forth. If you click on a book, it highlights it in red. Also shows you images from other parts of our collection at the same time. It's a great, again, serendipitous way through the collection that you don't get um, if you use a standard interface with 10 blue links on a page. It's just simply a, a new way in. So we would love to hear more from this crowd. I know there's a lot of developers here today and are going to participate in the Hackfest. We'd love to see development of new interfaces like this as well. We also announced really great new funding last night. Um, the marquee uh, uh, funding from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a million dollar grant for us to work with our hubs to help train public librarians in digital skills for the 21st century. You know, we have public library in the name of our, our organization, and it's important to us. We want to work with public libraries across the nation, 17,000 branch libraries in the United States. We want to be their partners to help them out. We've got lots of stuff from, in fact, their communities. And so the idea here is that we will go out, we're going to set up workshops, we're going to work with our hubs on that, train public librarians in this pilot phase, and then have them curate their local materials, both materials that are already in our collection from our over 1,000 partners that have donated materials, not just from their locales, but of course from other locales. And so uh, these public librarians can begin to become curators, very savvy digital curators of local materials, and ultimately begin to think about how they might scan in their local collections so that it can make its way upstream, not just to DPLA, but to the world. So we're really excited and thank the Bill and Melinda Gates for this funding. We've also had initial, uh, additional funding since launch from an anonymous donor who gave $450,000 to help us with our mission. Um, and of course, uh, again, if you were there last night, we have to thank again our partners, the Sloan Foundation, the Arcadia Fund, the Knight Foundation, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, all of whom have contributed so richly to what we're doing here this year and in coming years. So we want to thank all of our funders again um, for their support. You too can become a sponsor. And now we're at the t-shirt moment of the presentation. This is really critical. $5 a month, just $5 a month. I mean, that's now what? It's not even like a soy latte at, at Starbucks at this point with inflation. For $5 a month, you can go right now. Do it right now. People have laptops open. The t-shirts are going to run out. This is limited edition t-shirt that I am wearing here. So you have to go right now to dp.la slash donate. Begins at the $2 funding level if you just want a laptop sticker, which is very nice, and I encourage you to get that, all the way up to the, the full buffet, which is a tote bag, a mug. I think we have really cool water bottles. Um, there's no BPA in them. They're just <laughs> aluminum. Very high. This is high quality swag here, so you need to go out right now to dp.la slash donate. Choose your donation level. Um, and get your goodies out in the lobby. So I really do want to encourage you. We have little slider things out there. You can swipe your credit card, and you're good to go, and then you can look like me for the rest of the day. Um, I also want to emphasize that institutions can help donate and corporations as well. So we have some higher levels of funding than $2 a month for those institutions who want to support what we're doing. And we're going to set up a page and a way to really thank them at various levels from bronze to platinum on our website. It really would make a huge difference if you're the leader of an organization 
or it can bend the ear of a leader of an institution or corporation that wants to become a sponsor, that would mean a tremendous amount with us. We are a small organization, but we're really, really feisty, and we're doing a lot with what we've got, so more resources would, would really help us out. dp.la slash donate, easy to remember, tweet it now, go get your t-shirt. Okay, let's talk about API and apps. Um, we are really excited about this stat he right here. So we have a lot of traffic that comes to our site, and of course, a lot of folks going out to our, our partner sites. We also have 1.7 million users of our application, uh, uses of our application programming interface. And so for developers in the audience who haven't had a chance yet to look at our API, it's really simple to use. I'm a lousy programmer, and even I can use it. Um, so if you're a pro programmer, you'll really get into it. It's a great way to extract slices of what we have and use it in new applications. There's wonderful stuff going on with this. Culture Collage, which is this tremendous, it showed up in the, in the video to begin with. Um, you enter a term and it, it uh, expands out and fills the screen with images from our collection. You can actually save them as scrapbooks and share them with other people. We have incredible uh, mobile apps that are being developed with the DPL API, which I really love for our geocoded data for items that are geocoded. There are apps like OpenPix, open up your iPhone, hit on the GPS device, um, and you'll get materials from right around you, from all 1,100 partners of the DPLA right on your phone. It's really a cool experience. Whenever I go to a new place to talk about DPLA, I always pull out my phone and see what we've got from the neighborhood or the city that I'm in. It's really a lot of fun. We'd love to see more mobile apps. And, and I'm going to talk just in a, in a second about something else, but I think we also need ways to get better geocoding on our materials because we don't have all of it geocoded, and that's a really tricky problem. We have an app that has a logo of a hippo with a white mustache on it. <laughs> this is funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, thank you, NEH, which funded um, One Week, One Tool at George Mason University, my old home, and uh, they decided they love this idea of DPLA being a place for serendipitous discovery, which I think is really neat. I think the idea that you could encounter new things at the DPLA that, that were unexpected from all these places that you can't surf to individually, you can't go to 1,100 websites. So they created an app called Serendipomatic. You can just Google it, Serendipomatic. And um, what's really terrific about this is you just drop some text in, let's say a paper that you're writing, you can just actually cut and paste the text from the paper you're writing if you're a student, drop it into a box there at the bottom of the screen, and just a few seconds later, you'll get all the related materials from the DPLA that relate to whatever you're working on. Really incredible uh, way to make use of our collection in utterly new fashion. The reason we have the API is, again, we're a small organization. We can't anticipate how people want to use this incredible aggregated collection. So we want to make the API available so others can come up with things that have logos of hippos, green hippos, with mustaches. We'd love to see more of that. Let me talk about the community as well. Um, as I said last night, DPLA is people, right? It is, yes, it's a technical project. The first word in our name is digital, but it is created by people, it's supported by people, it's a collaboration. As I always say, it is more a social project than a technical project. We know how to do this technically, but it is a social project, a project that is based upon collaboration. And we want to expand out our circle, the people who can help us out. So we've announced that we've started the Community Reps Program. It's at dp.la slash reps. There's a short um, uh, application form uh, on the site. You'll get a package of goodies from us. And what this will allow us to do is to designate you as someone in your community that can uh, go out and evangelize for the project, teach people how to use the DPLA, maybe run local events like a hack fest or local history scanning event. Um, and we really need community reps out there across the United States um, to help us to let people know about the DPLA. Because to be honest, we're just in our first year, we're six months old, and we need more people to know about us, to use our materials to add to what we have um, and to become a part of the circle. Finally, what's coming next? Well, that's why we're here, right? We wanna talk about what's coming next. Um, we've always thought, and I think I've emphasized this morning, that we wanna do you know, better than this, right? A screen, if you're looking at Morris, Minnesota, maybe you were from there and you no longer live there, 
and you want to learn more about your hometown, um, sure, you can go to Google and you get this kind of hodgepodge of things. And that's great. It takes you to the Wikipedia page, um, maybe um, a, a specific site for the town. But we, of course, provide new interfaces, like our map interface, which really is people love it when they come to our website. Um, and that's a way for you to zoom right in. Um, you see these bubbles with, with uh, uh, the number of items from Morris, Minnesota. We have 36 items from Morris, Minnesota, which is really cool. Um, but of course, this begs the question, what else could we do with this? And I think you can see there that we've got gaps across this map. We can't go out through the countryside and fill those in. So how do we get that extra stuff? How do we get that, how do we fill in those gaps? And I think here we're thinking really a lot about this idea of DPLA local. What if we could customize our interface and provide it, uh, maybe an administrative interface for communities? to be able to administrate their local collection. Take what we've got, start with the map already localized on their communities, and have ways for them to add in and curate what's going on and overlay what they're doing. It's just an idea at this point. But as we've talked about it, and I think other people in the audience have thought more about what we could do for local communities, perhaps run by local public libraries, we love this idea of what we might be able to do together um, with, with this project of DPLA Local. There is a session today that will be talking about local events. Um, so I encourage you, if you're interested in this idea, to go to that as well. So that's where we are. We've got a lot to do today. Um, this is, and just as a reminder, a collaborative exercise. There, there will not be pontificating. There will not be, I'm sorry to have a PowerPoint slide, but there will not be more PowerPoint slides later today. This is a chance, and, and uh, I think Elizabeth mentioned that camp, to be very unconferency, to do something in a non-hierarchical fashion, to have discussions and workshops, to work together. I want to encourage everyone and just remind everyone that we really need certain things to happen to make sure that we have a great record of what goes on. Um, again, we will have co-leaders who will help launch off each session. And we have already set up, and it's on the website, if you go to um, the event website, we have Google Docs that are collaboratively written, and you can take notes on your session so that we can share them later. This is really important, and I encourage um, every session to take decent notes, and also, very critically, to just come back to us at the end of the day with one or two really compelling ideas, things that you felt your group wanted to do right now, and to go out there and work with the community on. So we'll report back and take those ideas and talk about them at the end of the day. So please do, if you are uh, leading a group, make sure that you can report back with something in addition to the notes. OK. Let me, we're about to kick off here, uh, but let me provide some logistics. OK. So um, as a reminder, we have our sessions going on at Simmons, concurrently with those that are going on here. Um, as I said, it's about a 15-minute walk. It's nice out there, it'll wake you up. Um, but there are also buses that are available just straight out the doors in front of us here. Um, there's a bus that will circulate back and forth between Simmons and here. Um, I encourage you to hop on that. The workshops will begin at 11, so we have ample time to do that. You still have time to get your t-shirt, just a reminder. Um, OK, we have staffers who are available um, to help you out with all this. So let me also talk about how to get to the different places. And I'm going to ask people, if I could, to just raise their hands so if you want to go to a specific workshop, you can locate them. OK, so first of all, um, for those who would like to go to room 333 of the Curry Student Center, that is Caroline and Lana. Oh, there's Caroline right back there. OK, so you will want to follow her so, um, uh, over to that room. Uh, today. Room two, uh, 340 is Sebastian, who's up here in the front. Oh, wait, we have penance. Excellent. <laughs> Sebastian is always prepared. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, <laughs> and Caitlin. Sorry, is Caitlin here as well? There we go. Caitlin, thank you so much. Hillary and Megan will be taking folks to room 344 of the Curry Student Center. Here we go. No pennant. Okay. Well, that's, sorry. We'll quickly create, construct one. OK. Oh, wait, there's a pennant in the back. Yes, Hillary. All right. Yellow pennant. OK. Thank you very much. Um, Rebecca and Abby. In, in, oh, here up front. 
Okay, we'll be going to room 348 of the Curry Student Center. Becca and Liz and Tom will be going to room 90 of the Snell Library. We have pennants, hands, uh-oh. What's that? Okay, great. Um, Becca, up here. Okay, John and Christy, room 421 of Snell Library. Jennifer, David, and Amar are at the four workshop venue spaces at Simmons, along with Frankie. So my colleague Frankie, there, we are, there she is, all right. Um, so uh, if you are making your way over to Simmons, grab Frankie, Jennifer, David, or Amar. Okay, um, other things, bags, which we have in the reserve section with some people um, back there. Uh, be sure just to take your bags. We won't be returning here at the end of the day. We'll actually be convening again at the end of the day in 20 West Village F, which my understanding is, is if we go back out um, uh, front doors and take a left and go down a few blocks, it's just after the law school sign, if I've got that correct, on the left. So it's uh, just down campus uh, a couple of blocks. Um, and um, we've got a good crowd. We do have some rooms that are smaller than others. We have to do it a little bit on a first come, first, first serve basis in terms of squeezing into the rooms, but we will do our absolute best to accommodate everyone as we can. Um, just a reminder, at the end of the day, we will have those wrap up, um, wrap up thoughts at West Village at 20, West Village F, and then we will collapse and celebrate um, uh, the end of, of a great DPLA fest. So I wanna thank you all for coming, for spending your time and energy to help out with DPLA Fest 2013. This is the first one. You will say you were here. You were at the first annual DPLA Fest. So thank you so much and enjoy the day.